Good morning, dear Tay, dear community. Today is the 19th of June, the year 2019, and we're in Upper Hamlet, Plum Village, France. And uh, this morning we have an opportunity to have a session of questions and answers. Um, before we begin, may I ask if Brother Faplin and Brother Fakli are also in the audience somewhere? Uh, uh, Brother Fakli? He's hidden somewhere. <laughs> Not yet manifested. Um, I feel a bit tricked sitting up here actually because they said, oh, everybody who's been on the teaching panel, this retreat will be up here. So <laughs> now that I don't see them, I have to, you know, ask, practice non-self is what my sister is saying. <laughs> um, anyhow, they'll manifest at some point or another. Um, I would like to say a few words about questions and answers and our format here in Plum Village uh, for those of you who are new. So when we have a session like this, it's um, a chance for us to ask what we call questions from the heart. And uh, it's a question that uh, has to do with your happiness, your joy, your pain or your suffering, your real experiences, not any kind of theoretical, quest theoretical questions or concerns, philosophical questions or concerns. Um, those questions may take a lifetime to answer. I don't think we can do it in one hour. <laughs> um, so we can save those questions for later. But in this session, we have a chance to um, ask the questions from our heart. And the question from the heart may be a question that um, has been in your mind for uh, a while. And uh, maybe you have not uh, had an opportunity to ask that of anyone for whatever reason. You may feel that, uh, oh, if I ask this question, they may not understand understand me. If I ask this question, I might feel judged. If I ask this question, uh, it might say something about my intellect. And then we may have never voiced our question before. And uh, a good question doesn't necessarily have to be a smart question. Uh, a good question may also be something that uh, is very common, already there. Maybe you think you're the only one who has it, or maybe everybody has figured out the answer already. Um, but many people may be grateful to you if you're able to articulate that question. It's a question you may ask for everyone. So no question is a bad question. <laughs> Uh, every question is a good question, as long, so long as it comes from a real concern that you have concerning your happiness, your suffering, your difficulties, your joys, and how to go in the direction of well-being, uh, how to bring more well-being into my life. Or these are the blocks, these are the obstacles that I have. Um, and what are your experiences in handling these things? So we are up here, the four of us are here to just share with you the experiences that we have in addressing some of, uh, or handling some of the questions that you might pose. We don't claim any expertise. <laughs> uh, but we just share with you from our own experiences. And in this way, it's a true exchange, uh, and we can truly learn from one another in a spirit of uh, openness, non-discrimination, 
uh, non-judgment. Mm. And there may be a question that um, is buried deep inside of your heart. Sometimes it may come up in your mind, but you just want to push it down. You don't even dare ask it, even to yourself. It's just uh, very fuzzy, but you know it's there. So during this session, if you uh, find that uh, it becomes a bit more clear in your mind, we wish you the courage to be able to articulate your question. And we have a chair up here. It's the hot spot. <laughs> um, it could be a warm spot because you feel all of the, you know, um, all of the support from every one of us here in this hall. So when you sit up there, it's not uh, a place of interrogation or anything, but uh, that seat is uh, for holding, for holding your question, uh, for uh, holding your presence, uh, and uh, making use of the collective energy of the Sangha uh, to be there for one another. Uh, to hold each other in our uh, place, wherever it is that we are, uh, we may be at the moment. Mm, so we will begin by introducing our panelists. <laughs> yes. So my name is Sister Langyu. Uh, to my left, I'm having trouble. <laughs> I don't know what that says about <laughs> what's going on uh, up here. <laughs> you can tell me later. <laughs> uh, to, to my left is uh, my sister Hien Yim, sister True Dedication. Um, she has been in the Plum Village tradition actually way before she ordained as a nun. She started coming in her uh, teens late teens, and, uh, okay, fine, 21. Uh, okay, Brother Fuflin at 19. This is a true dedication at age 21. And um, so she has been with the Plum Village uh, Sangha for quite a while in many different forms uh, as a lay practitioner coming here and attending retreats like yourself. Uh, as a wake-upper in London, walking the streets of London in mindfulness, catching the subway. So bringing Plum Village practice to the heart of London, metropolitan. <laughs> and uh, she's also been um, uh, sometimes a Plum Village uh, voice in the international media. So she's, we're very happy that she's here, and giving her, offering her presence to this uh, session. And next to Sister Hingham is Brother Fap Lu, Brother Stream. He, brother Stream is now the eldest brother in Shengha, uh, which is the uh, the monastery down the down the hill from Upper Hamlet. And uh, uh, he's also been with Plum Village for quite a while, and uh, a very uh, a stable and uh, a reliable older brother. Uh, many, many of our uh, younger brothers and sisters and lay friends have come to take refuge in Brother Fablu in his uh, wisdom, his insight, and also in his practice, especially of uh, practice of building brotherhood and sisterhood and just how to be present. Um, and he's also involved in many, many different projects. Wherever there's a project that is visible in Plum Village, chances are Brother Faflu has <laughs> lent his support. Um, so we're also very happy that he's here with us on the panel. Next to Brother Faflu is Brother Fabiu. Uh, Brother Fabiu has been coming to Plum Village as a, a, a teenager. Or is it a child? 
so he's really uh, he's really ha has uh, he really has Plum Village blood in his veins. <laughs> All of his uh, mental formations have been Plum Village modified. <laughs> mindfulness modified <laughs> and um, his parents are also here I don't know if they're here at this moment um, oh they're here okay there's one Papa is here somewhere I don't know but they're, his parents are living in Lower Hamlet uh, right now and they love to be with the sisters and sometimes we wonder you know <laughs> why does his parents stay in Lower Hamlet while well, their son is in Upper Hamlet <laughs> It's a huge koan, and it says something about the Plum Village family. So Brother Fabio is uh, here as a member of the Plum Village family. And uh, so we're all here, available to you, uh, to address any questions that uh, you may have. And we can begin this session with three sounds of the bell. Um, please allow yourself to enjoy the sound of the bell and allow yourself to just uh, enjoy the presence of your body, your posture, and your breathing. So if you would like, you can take the seat up here. And for those of us who are a bit more shy, and uh, the seat is a bit intense for you, <laughs> and, and you still have a question, you may like to write it down and pass it towards the, the bell, the direction of the bell. And also for those of you who have questions, you can make a line behind this um, chair. Dear Thai, dear communities, dear respected teachers, uh, I guess my question is, what is the relationship between direct experience and the intellect? Um, for example, when we have in the dinners, and sometimes we hear the felicity facilitators to guide us, come back to our breathing. Um, yes, that kind of thing, I can have a direct experience. Uh, be aware of the body, allow the body to relax. I also can have that is direct experience. Also the five senses of the food, like the taste, the smell, the sound, the five senses of the food. So I feel I can have uh, the direct experience. But when we begin to do the contemplations, like when we have the ball, the food, and then we say, this food is the gift of the universe, the earth, 
um, animals and a lot of words, then I feel their thoughts arising in my mind. And um, I'm not sure when people really direct experience that, do they literally see the earth and the sky and the thing in the food? Um, or how, how is this like when they really direct experience that insight? And when they really direct experience that, do we still have the thoughts involved? So I'm not sure if it's clear the questions. Yeah, thank you. Can I ask a, so this question you, you ask, um, how, how do you find that it affects your practice? How does it uh, affect you, you know, in, in your lived experience of the practice? Just to elaborate a little bit on your, your motivation. Um, uh, I think my question is, what is the relationship between the a direct experience and the intellect, because when I practice, uh, for example, the five contemplations, so when I look at the food, I can uh, direct experience the five senses, my body, my breathing, but when I uh, contemplate on the five contemplations, I feel there are thoughts arising in me, and I don't know um, what is the difference, how is different when people really experience that, but not just having thoughts about it. And when people really direct experience that, uh, uh, thoughts still are there, and the intellect play any role in helping us to have the direct experience. Thank you. Dear friends, um, dear brother, <laughs> I like this question very much. Um, because it touches on something to do with how we um, can practice very deeply and through getting in touch deeply with the present moment and the historical dimension through our senses, like you say, of taste and touch and flavor we can also touch something much deeper so this is something also to do with the practice of stopping and then looking deeply. So while we eat, we are getting in touch with each point, point instant. <laughs> okay, what is going on for us in that moment, in our body and with the community around us or the environment around us. And at the same time, we're practicing looking deeply. My experience is that when we receive like the teachings and the Dharma, like in the five contemplations, they're like kind of rain that falls on the soil of our store consciousness. And that allows us to touch the food even more deeply than just the physical experience of it. Thai has uh, spoken of one uh, morsel of food as the ambassador of the cosmos. We are inviting in the entire cosmos. So it's not just a carrot with the quality of orangeness, softness or crunchiness, um, sweetness. It's so much more than that. And we allow um, our deep looking and our insight uh, to allow us to touch that even more profoundly in the very moment we're chewing the carrot. I had a wonderful experience one time while eating lunch in the lower hamlet with the sisters. And um, 
Actually, I think I have to remember what kind of grain it was. I actually think we were eating breakfast, um, and I was contemplating the oatmeal, the um, porridge. And I had studied a bit about the history of foods, and I realized that my ancestors and our ancestors over many thousand generations had had much harder grains. And that's why they had really good teeth, because they did a lot more chewing. And that it's only uh, maybe in the last 10 or 20,000 years that we've had softer grains. And I cannot tell you where this insight came from, but I was suddenly flooded with gratitude for the softness of my porridge, my oatmeal. I felt like I was eating the gift of many generations. It wasn't just my bowl of porridge, but it was only possible because of the whole arc of time that had led to it. And I felt so connected to them, their skill, and their kind of love somehow through the food. And I started crying <laughs> in the dining hall. So for me, I think that insight came from store consciousness. Store consciousness that had absorbed the teaching and the deep looking, had got into deep contact with the porridge in the present moment, and then bloomed from store consciousness a seed of insight. And uh, the great thing about insights is it changes us somehow. I cannot say that every bowl of porridge, I have been fully in touch with that insight, every mouthful, but it has changed how I appreciate. It has changed me deeply. I have a, a kind of sense maybe also of humility while I eat, and I can touch space and time more deeply while I eat. But each one of us will have like different insights about the food. Um, and this is really important because we practice mindfulness not just to be mindful in that moment, but to sustain our mindfulness with concentration so that we get an insight that liberates us. So what would be my liberating insight about the porridge? Mm. I think it helped me to see that it's not exactly my porridge. And that was a very wonderful insight for me. Thank you. Dear Thai, dear teachers, dear community. Um, <coughs> recently I've been at a Sangha meeting and a younger sister um, was very concerned about that she wasn't really sure about what to do in her life. And I answered a bit in a funny way, you know, I'm 45 years old, I'm having a PhD, and I still have no clue what I actually want to do in my life. So I think for her that was um, maybe a bit of a relief. Um, but for me, um, when I look back at my history and uh, the things that happened in my life, um, whenever um, I had the feeling that I was there with my full heart in terms of what I wanted to do, what I really wanted to do, something happened which which um, um, made it for me impossible to continue there. So some sort of um, very difficult experience that I had. So I reached a point where um, I'm at the moment not sure uh, where my path is and my heart isn't really telling me anything and that's for quite a long time now for 
um, and that keeps on being a source of suffering for me. Um, I know I have a lot of capacities, I know I can offer a lot to people, and I don't find a real way to make that um, blooming again. And uh, I think a lot of people have similar feelings about that they're not sure where to go, what to do, and we're looking at these people who are so amazing that they can bring all their energy and joy to others. And um, for me this is uh, quite a difficult um, yeah, concern that I'm not able to open up and share my capacities with others. Um, maybe you can share some experience on how to go through such a difficult uh, situation or to give some support in how to, if the heart isn't really telling what to do, how can we find this? So, dear brother, <laughs> thank you for your courage to ask the question. Uh, I think there are many people in this room who don't know where they're going. <laughs> so you're not alone. <laughs> Brother Fablai yesterday shared about the uh, actions of body, speech and mind. And I find this teaching very deep and very helpful. It's something I practice using every moment to see what kind of actions, uh, what kind of speech, what kind of thought that I can produce right here and right now that bring me joy, that bring others joy, <laughs> or at least cause less harm. <laughs> and uh, I'm quite imperfect in that. <laughs> I know sometimes I still produce thoughts that cause harm to myself and to others. And I, I know that I, I sometimes say things that uh, are not just uh, not causing harm, <laughs> they cause harm. And so uh, when I ask myself, what am I doing? Well, I'm looking into that r right here and right now and every moment. I, I'm in Dhamma sharing, you know, I, I, I try to practice just like walking meditation, eating meditation, <laughs> Um, sitting meditation to, to take my speech and my listening as the object of my meditation. And in training in that, then I find throughout the day something changes in my speech, something changes in my thinking. And situations which, if I followed my, my habit energy, would go in a different direction in the past suddenly go in the direction of understanding and joy. That is a... I feel deeply that is our true career. <laughs> and uh, the question, what will, what will I do with my life, <laughs> is tricky. It's a kind of trick question. Because it, it puts what we're doing out there. It's like something out there, out in the world, and, and I need to arrive there to become part of that thing, to do that thing. And it seems like what we're thinking, what we're saying, and we're doing right here and right now has nothing to do with that, that thing that we're supposed to do over there. And so no wonder our heart is not... I mean, I, I find if I... If I yeah, you know, for example, in my case, I I think about uh, my my um, peers that I went to university with, <laughs> and I see you know they're a lawyer, a doctor, uh, <laughs> in a high government position, and then I th if I start to create an idea of myself, and I can start to feel oh gosh, what am I doing? When will I figure out what I want to do? 
you, you see. So we have this concentration called aimlessness. I think it's already shared about it in, in the retreat. It's very deep. When we notice we're having an idea about happiness, then the normal thing, we try to get that thing. We try to realize that idea. We try to do that thing, realize that thing in our life. But if we, are, we know how to practice to, like Fablai shared, bring the lens of concentration is like putting on a, some glasses. <laughs> and we look at the way with the eyes of aimlessness. We look at our life with the, the lens of aimlessness. And we notice that any idea that we put out there may become an obstacle to our true happiness, our true freedom. So maybe if you look deeper into that question, what, what do I want to do with my life? <laughs> with the eyes of aimlessness. <laughs> then you see that right here, right now, with your breathing, with your step, you're already making thousands of decisions. There's thousands of point manifestations, <laughs> point instant. And uh, the circle, like Sister Langnim shared, of light is made up of these instants of thoughts of joy, speech of, that generates happiness actions that are coming from compassion. And then before we know it, the circle of our life is illuminated as one whole circle by really in every moment concentrating on those points and seeing the world with the lens of aimlessness, the concentration on aimlessness. And then we find ourselves already in the midst of the life that we've always wanted truly happy, truly fulfilled. Maybe. <laughs> that, I think that's a little bit the, you know, our path as monastics is like that. We start out and we're not quite sure <laughs> what we're doing, but then as we go along, the seeds in our consciousness are watered by the collective body of the Sangha and we, we end up becoming a beautiful flower, a fruit. The apple doesn't know it wanted to be an apple. <laughs> It didn't ask, what do I want to do with my life? Thank you for your question. Dear Thai, dear beloved community, dear respected teachers, um, my question is about how to concentrate um, my energy that I feel is very divided. So I work as a, as a psychiatrist and as a therapist and as a researcher. Um, and so some days I find myself in clinic and then I run to my therapy session and then I drive over to my research institute um, and in the evening I'm trying to write papers or sangha building um, and although I find it very joyful and there are moments of uh, and I'm doing what I love um, and I, I feel that Often I'm able to stay concentrated in the moment, in maybe that session. Um, but I also have this strong feeling that my energies are very scattered. Um, and uh, my different bosses will always want more time. Um, I find myself sometimes falling behind on my grant deadlines or um, on my projects, um, and I, uh, I think it affects my personal life as well, that I'm spending 
my home time on work as well. Um, and so uh, I feel that I'm, I'm trying very hard and I'm planning things out and I'm trying to be very uh, careful about what I take on, but yet I still feel like I'm trying to catch up all the time. The Sangha, I think Sister Langim is inviting me to share because she's very good with deadlines. I'm always following behind. <laughs> we work together on the editorial team, so she knows. <laughs> um, there's one thing that, that comes to mind when I, when I hear your uh, your question, and it, um, I think I related this question a lot to, to meditation in my life. Not in particular to concentration, but I feel it's more or less uh, the, same, um, the same contemplation that I did, which is why can I not uh, focus on my meditation? Why do I go and I sit on my cushion and my mind is scattered and I think this and that and I don't feel I'm fully taking advantage of that time. I feel like from the moment I touch my cushion to the moment the bell is invited to end the meditation, uh, my mind is constantly working. Or I feel sleepy or I feel restless and I can't really take advantage of that time. And so that has been the cone that I worked with for, for a number of years also as a monk not just as a layperson, before when I was a layperson much, but also as a monastic that was very alive. And um, I think that slowly I started to realize that, that, that my mind likes to divide up my day in many little boxes. And, and I really uh, have the tendency to think that they're all divided, that they're all, you know, this is the moment I, I start my meditation. And so, you know, that's when I meditate. And then the moment I, I, I go to work or uh, I go back to the residence, I rest, that's working time, that's rest time. And this is a very strong tendency that I see I have. And, uh, and slowly I started to realize that this is not really how, how meditation works. Somehow, the moment I sit on my cushion in the morning is very intimately connected to how I wake up in the morning, to what I did the day before, to the interaction I have with my brothers. If something is stuck with my brothers, it's going to come back in my meditation. And, I, and, and I'm going to be thinking about it. <laughs> so, um, I feel that Probably this, this tendency to divide things in objects and to look at different things as, as if they separate is, is what is creating a lot of trouble on our planet. Not just at a personal level in which we divide our life and we, and we, we struggle to sort of uh, realize what, we, what we're aiming to, but also at a global level in which we are really doing a lot of damage to our planet, to our society, to our environment. And I feel there is two things that really help me to, to understand how the practice works and how to, to make things fall into place. And one is, a, is to consider it not as a thing, not to consider the practice or concentration or meditation as a thing, but to consider it as an ecosystem, right? I feel we've done a lot of trouble to our planet because we can't understand this idea it doesn't relate to our daily life, you know, but actually you see, you know, everything is interrelated. So if you're not able to be concentrated, it's not about your lack of concentration. There's a global question that you need to ask about how you organize your life. And, uh, and there, are, there might be many little things that you could do to surround yourself with an environment, with an ecosystem that is conducive to developing the practice. So once you have that, once you have the condition around you, then you don't need to struggle anymore. The practice is something normal. Because the practice is like a seed. If you plant it in the right environment, it will, it will 
put out its roots and it slowly start to blossom. And then you will not need to sort of like feel you're always struggling to, to hold things together or to, to go in the direction you want to go. It sort of happens by itself. You know, and that's where we understand, you know, that, you know, there is that image of a, of a young boy uh, sitting on the back of a buffalo playing the flute. That's the image that we offer for a practitioner. A practitioner, you're just sitting on the back of the buffalo, you know, and then you let the buffalo carry you. And at that time, you can amuse yourself. You can play the flute or you can do something else if you like. But the buffalo needs to be there, right? You know, if the buffalo is not there, if the buffalo is not going the right direction, then we, you know, will have a hard time. However hard we, 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 we get upset with, with the situation, it's not really going to change. So I think is we, we sort of sometimes we need to ask ourselves, how is my environment? We go back to our house, and we look at things around ourselves and, and we can ask ourselves, how are things helping me to practice and what are the things that, uh, uh, that sort of are not conducive to me uh, developing a habit of practice. I think you, you have a background in psychology, so some of these things I'm sure that will not be difficult for you to understand. Sometime I go back to my room when I have a problem and I look at my corner, you know, where I have my bed. And I realize, you know, the way objects are put, the way my bed is set up, the way things are there, are, is a projection of the struggle that there is inside of my mind. So one of the things I train to do as a novice is when I'm suffering, I go back and I clean my room. And I keep it tidy. And that really helps me, you know. <laughs> it's funny, right? It's just a room, you know. What's, how is that connected to my, you know, to my life, to my meditation? No, it actually has a very big effect. In fact, at that point in time, it has a much greater impact on my practice than if I was to say, oh, I'm going to sit in meditation and get rid of my, of my suffering and focus. Ooh. <laughs> I tried to do that. <laughs> I suffered a lot because then you start struggling and your meditation becomes a battle against yourself, basically. Um, when we sit, the, the mind will offer us back what we have watered. So if you cannot focus, at least you can ask yourself, what is this thing that my mind is showing me? It's obviously delivering a message. And so before the thoughts calm down, they need to be listened. The moment you've been able to listen and to truly embrace what is happening in your mind and to understand and create this space of like, oh, okay, I see why you're like that. I, I, I truly accept that. You know, the moment we've been able to do that, then slowly it becomes a little bit more easy for us to focus, to calm down, to keep things together. But that requires a space and a time, you know, to be able to do that. So I think you're very fortunate. You already have a sangha, and and you became very engaged in the in the in in your community. And I was very happy to know that. And and I think that's already great fortune. And that will help you if you want, if you know how to exploit the 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 capacity of a sangha. That will help you to plant a seed of questioning. In uh, in the in the meditation tradition, there is the practice of a, of the koan. You know, and and you know, Zen master they say funny things like, uh, "What is the sound of one hand clapping?" or, or whatever. Who's the one uh, reciting the Buddha's name and things like that? But what is uh, a true koan? You know, a true koan is something that is really there in life. And sometimes there's some question you have. It's not going to be easy to 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 find out the answer. You have to sit with it. And it has to sit on your stomach for a year, maybe two years sometimes. And you have to practice slowly embracing it and slowly easing into the discomfort of that question. A koan is a very uncomfortable question. What do I do in my life? Well, that's a koan. Um, how come 
I cannot do what I really want with my life, that's also a con. You know, and then your Sangha will allow you to have the space to be contemplating that question, to keep it alive, to keep being vulnerable with it, to keep saying, I haven't figured it out, I'm still working with this. That's, that, that is good meditation, you know. So, good luck. <laughs> Dear Thai, dear friends, dear family, my question is about uh, the four diligences, if we can have a quick uh, insight explanation on how to, to practice them. So dear Thai, dear uh, community, I think we said the other day um, that the models we have and present to you in terms of mind and uh, practice all have to do with our happiness or our suffering. And the four diligences are no different. Um, we have to be able to recognize what brings us happiness. We have to be able to recognize what well-being means to us. Um, how does it feel? Well-being. How does well-being feel to us? Uh, in our mind and also in our body, in our environment. What does uh, a healthy human being uh, feel like, look like? What does a healthy environment for a human being or other all species feel like and look like. So I think we have to be able to recognize and identify uh, these things. Mm, uh, before we can practice the four diligences. Uh, otherwise you have no kind of uh, map. Uh, no, you know, it's just an idea in your mind, the four diligences. And they're basically recognizing the things that are conducive to happiness. We want to be able to support those conditions. We want to be able to bring about those conditions. And the things that are not conducive to happiness, that bring about ill-being, we want to be able to do our best to prevent them, uh, to address them if they're present, or else to prevent them from arising. And this, I think, have many uh, of the different ways that we can do that have been covered in our Dharma talks and also I heard in the presentations many, many different ways that uh, each of us are going about in helping to bring about more well-being into ourselves, into our uh, families, communities, society, and the earth. And also many different ways to prevent to take care of the ill-being that's there and also to prevent it from uh, arising or becoming worse. Um, so you can start with the four diligences with your own uh, individual self. You can begin with your, uh, let's say, with your thoughts, right? With the mental formations that come up in you. And you have to be able to identify if those men mental formations, if those thoughts that arise in you are conducive to your well-being or not. Uh, is this thought adding to my happiness? It's a very simple question. Is this thought helpful to myself or others? Or is this thought, does it have the flavor of uh, uh, hatred? discrimination. Does this thought bring about peace to myself? 
bring about joy, happiness to myself or others. Um, so when you can, you can identify, you can question, add that question to the thoughts that arise in you. And it only takes a second with mindfulness, you know. Uh, you really, it, it just takes a very, very short second for you to recognize whether this thought is helpful to your happiness, your peace or well-being or not. You don't have to fumigate and take a long time to decide because you can actually feel it very immediately if this thought is bringing you closer to the other person or adding more separation to you and your loved one, for instance. So we begin this um, process, you know, in the traditional uh, Buddhist teachings, they often use the term purification. And again, these terms are used not in moral judgment of right and wrong or evil and uh, good and evil, but uh, things that are, will be conducive to peace and happiness. So you begin this process every day. The thoughts that arise in you, you start to train <clears throat> to train yourself in the process of recognizing and filtering, selecting the thoughts that you would like to uh, um, to keep or to continue to produce more and more in you. Um, thinking is not a bad thing. From the questions that I heard uh, earlier, I heard a little bit of uh, discrimination between uh, thought and uh, direct experience. Actually, if we know how to make use of the thoughts, uh, it could help us. It's conducive to direct experience as well. So we have to make use, we have to learn how to make use of our thinking. Uh, it's not that we prefer ex direct experience over thinking. Both thinking and direct experience are a part of our being. Um, it's like if you just want the direct experience, you just want the lotus without the mud, for instance. Um, that's what it is. So we also, as practitioners, need to train ourselves to recognize that mind of discrimination. And it's quite pervasive. And uh, maybe as therapists, as scientists, as uh, meditators together, we can learn how to help each other to identify uh, the mind of discrimination when it arises, how to help each other identify it. So going back to the four diligence <laughs> and how to practice and apply into our daily life. Um, so thoughts, you can start to kind of um, filter out the ones that are not so helpful to us. And in that way, we can begin to transform the way that we think. Uh, and the essential uh, element, the first uh, thing that will be able to help you to do so is your own presence. You have to be able to know how to come home to yourself, come home to your thoughts, and not just allow your thoughts to carry you away in this direction or that direction all the time. Uh, in that way, if we're constantly carried away by our thoughts, we're only victims of our thinking. We have no sovereignty over our thinking. And that's why the practice of mindfulness is so important. So that's in the realm of the thinking. Um, we can also address our feelings in the same way. Mm. Feelings are happening all the time. There's, you know, in, in Buddhism is. Um, They've quite uh, simplified it, and I really love this simplification uh, because it's quite helpful. I don't have to name all the feelings, but I just have to say, ah, <laughs> this feeling that arises, is it a pleasant feeling? You know, does it make me feel well, basically? And then if it does, you know, I'll, I'll continue to, um, to be with the feeling. And the feeling that comes up, is it making me feel uncomfortable, unpleasant? Is this an unpleasant feeling? And the next question is, how can I take care of this unpleasant feeling in me? The feeling may be a, a physical pain in our body. And uh, 
So with mindfulness, when we come back to our body, we can recognize uh, the physical pain that's in our body. And just being there, recognizing it, can already begin to give you some insight into how to take care of it. For instance, we're on the computer sitting down all day and we have back pain. It's quite obvious how you can take care of this back pain. You know, do I need to sit a whole hour in front of the computer or can I stand up every five minutes or ten minutes, etc. So you can learn how to take care of the pleasant feelings that come up in you. And then there are neutral feelings. And this is the part that we shared in our Dharma talk the other day. Learning how to transform this neutral feeling into a positive feeling, a pleasant feeling. Most feelings we have throughout the day will be, um, you can say, neutral because you don't notice it. We take it for granted. But it could also be a very pleasant feeling. Like sitting here and feeling no pain. You probably won't notice it, but that's all. That's actually a very good feeling, not knowing, you know, not experiencing pain at this moment. So learning how to identify moment to moment the feelings that are arising in you. And that's uh, a way of practicing the four diligence. So it's, um, you can apply it to the realm of your body, your feelings, your perceptions, your mental formations, and even your consciousness. Um, and it has to be conducive to your happiness. So basically, what the four diligences uh, is, is uh, a process of selective watering, a uh, process of selection. Selecting the thoughts, the feelings, the perceptions, the actions that are conducive to our well-being. Um, and even identifying the conditions um, that will help to bring about the, that well-being in the body, in the thoughts, perceptions, etc. Um, so if, it's, if the well-being is not there yet, you might think about your environment and how to create the conditions to help support that well-being. And the same goes with ill-being. You have to be able to identify it and uh, help to take care of it, whether that ill-being is happening in your body, in your feelings, perceptions, mental formations, or consciousness. If we look into the collective consciousness now, we can identify a lot of ill-being. For instance, uh, fear is a big one. Mm. How, what can I do to reduce the fear in the collective consciousness? Um, through the things that we are consuming as a society, as, in, as individuals or as a society. So you can take care and practice the four diligences on that level, for instance. Well, I think the answer is pretty clear by now. Yeah. I, I wish every one of us good luck in practicing this. It takes some deep looking to identify uh, the concrete ways in which you can put this into practice. Dearest. Dearest Thai community, sisters and brothers from village, my heart's pounding. I have been practicing mindfulness meditation, the practice of Thich Nhat Hanh for many years. And after the, um, after the soulmate of the Buddha retreat last year, I went back home and I really focused on bringing my mind and my body together into finding release from trauma, past pain, hurts. Because I just heard so much positivity coming from the retreat. And I came across a, um, a little, a few words by Viktor Frankl. Um, between stimulus and response, there's a space. 
and we can choose how we respond. And with that, I kind of sat and I did my readings and meditation. And over time, I realized that I kind of softened and my seeds of negativity and pain that sat in trauma were dissolving and beautiful other flowers were coming up. And obviously the one that always sits with me is no mud, no lotus, and that's profound for me. And um, during my studies, I spoke to one of the professors and I said to him, I've actually discovered pathway to freedom and I found it at Plum Village. And he wasn't quite aware of who, what I was meaning and or anything about this practice. But I can honestly ask you, my journey to freedom and literally forgiving those that have hurt me and just being a more comfortable, calmer human being and more self-compassionate and forgiving myself has helped me to show compassion and forgiveness to others. Is this... Is this it? Because <laughs> this is, for me, as good as it gets. I feel free. I feel at peace. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your beautiful sharing. But yeah, I just add that um, make good use of the joy that you get from the practice because uh, we know that joy, like everything, is impermanent. So sometimes um, in our life as practitioners we have periods of joy that last for a long time and we're getting a lot of transformation and healing. And so we, we tend to treat that joy and ease as something that's permanent. And so I always try to remind myself when I'm feeling happiness and joy, that is the time I can use that energy to go deeper into the practice. You see, so it's, it's, it, it has this uh, self-renewing quality, like self-healing quality of the practice. Um, and then uh, you, you build up your capacity, you, exp you expand your capacity to, to embrace uh, the suffering both in yourself and in others. So it's a joy to recognize that, the transformation happening. And, and I just would say, as a, as a fellow practitioner, that, that make good use of those conditions and go deeper. Yeah. You, you get, there's always, uh, we cannot reach the end of insight, we cannot reach the end of our joy and happiness and peace. Thank you. have a written question. Is it possible, and if yes, to keep and feed my positive energy seeds in a toxic environment, as in, in a bank, a job in a bank? <laughs> it's, it's, it goes on. For, already for a few years, I, I um, would like to leave my job because the people are malicious. And I had two burnouts. But I stay for the moment because I'm afraid of running out of money as I'm sing a single mother with children and, not, and then running out of money and not being able to find a fulfilling job. Thank you very much for your wisdom and advice. So the question is again, is it possible and if yes, to keep, how? To keep and feed my positive energy seeds in a toxic environment as in a, a job in a bank, bank job?
Dear Thai, dear beloved community, um, this is a very good question. And it has something to do with right livelihood. Uh, in my own experience working in, a, in the politics part of a newsroom, If we are mindful in our workplace, we will get some insights about the nature of the environment. Um, we will be able to feel what our day is doing to us, <laughs> what it's triggering, which seeds are being watered in us as a result of our working day and also as a result of the environment, the, whether there is enough air in the office, whether we can see any trees, what, what, of what does our day consist? What is our day made of? Uh, and as we've been practicing and hearing on this retreat, when we are mindful, that is giving us the energy of awareness relating to ourselves, our own body, our feelings, our mind. So we're seeing what is going on for us. And we can also pick up what is going on for our colleagues. So we can feel their anger or their frustration or their... Um, mm, even their sorrows. And uh, it may be very wonderful to start to practice listening in our workplace to really connect to our colleagues as human beings. And then we may also realize the nature of the work that we are being asked to do and invest our life energy in realizing. And with the energy of mindfulness, we will be able to ask ourselves, is this what I would like to invest my energy in? And uh, we may look at the outcome of our workplace, and we may um, want to try to change the outcome with the insight of the five mindfulness trainings. Maybe there are ways we could nudge it, nudge it a little bit more in a wholesome direction, so that as a, as a business, uh, an organization, a corporation, uh, we are watering more good seeds in the world as an out outcome of this investment of all these people's working life energy. I think it would be wonderful to have awakened ethical bankers <laughs> that know how to really be there for themselves, be there for each other, and be there to look deeply into the, the impact of their investments on the planet, on those who are more in need, wherever they are in the world. And perhaps, in fact, there is not any environment where we wouldn't wish for there to be awakened people working in those environments. And Thai has given wonderful responses to questions about the military or even arms production. I think all of us would wish to have people who are doing their best to practice the five mindfulness trainings in those very environments. I, I was passionate about the fact that um, I really believed that mindful journalism must be possible, awakened, nourishing, inspiring journalism must be possible. And uh, that kept me in my workplace um, for three years. Even though one day while standing up from my desk and walking mindfully to get a glass of water, and 
hearing two colleagues uh, arguing and another colleague swearing at the live news feed. And I thought, wow, I'm in a toxic environment. <laughs> <laughs> Breathing in, I know I'm in a toxic environment. <laughs> Breathing out, I'm in a toxic environment. <laughs> um, and it was very helpful to download that insight to my store consciousness. And uh, week after week of practicing mindful walking across the office to the water cooler. Finally, that gave rise to another insight, which was, this is not good for me, and it is okay to leave. <laughs> I need to get myself out of here. And it came up from store consciousness as a very clear realization even though I had a very strong aspiration that I wished it would be possible to stay. And then there came a time in my monastic life when uh, Thay said, Hing uh, Yim, you need to organize a retreat for journalists. <laughs> and I have to say, unfortunately, my practice was still very weak and it gave re rise to the mental formation of anger. <laughs> I came here to not be a journalist, <laughs> to not have to be with these people. <laughs> and uh, so I tried, I tried to say no to Thai. <laughs> At that time, I was really enjoying working in the vegetable garden. These are the kind of seeds that I want to be cultivating. And the earth was very peaceful and didn't swear and wasn't burnt out, wasn't negative, wasn't cynical. And uh, so I sent a message back to Thai. Well, please tell Thai that Hinyam says she's not available. <laughs> <laughs> and I got another message back from Thai. Please tell Hinyam. <laughs> that there is no difference between working in the vegetable garden and organizing a retreat for journalists. <laughs> <laughs> so it's all cultivating good seeds. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of what garden, you know, which garden. And uh, we had a chance, I think it was in 2015, to offer a day of mindfulness at the Columbia School of Journalism. And uh, it was very meaningful. And uh, they were very thirsty for the practice. So I think we can all ask ourselves in our environment, uh, first of all, how can we sustain our personal practice at work? What are the moments that can keep us fresh when can we come back in touch with our breathing or our mindful steps during our working day? How can we practice in meetings? Can we follow our breathing and listen deeply uh, to our colleagues? How can we water good seeds in our teams? How can we nurture those who need nurturing? Who? Uh, how can we appreciate qualities and goodness like in the, in the garden of our team and offer a little fertilizer and encouragement to our colleagues? And everyone, no matter where they work, uh, we all have those seeds um, of mindfulness, of compassion, of awakening. And we can water those seeds in anyone, no matter what work we are engaging in. And when we can take care of ourselves and our colleagues, then uh, I have faith that any kind of um, enterprise uh, can become uh, more awakened. And with the collective insight of the employees, we can also create more ethical, compassionate, and awakened um, organizations in the world. Bankers have a lot of capacity to invest well. 
and we are very grateful for their positive investments in renewable energy, uh, in sustainable communities, in uh, shifting the energy of money to uh, the kind of uh, industries that can help protect our planet and protect our future. So, uh, awakened bankers can change the world. Thank you. So this will be the last question. Dear Thai, dear sisters, dear brothers, dear family, I have a question about the breath. Um, I'm wondering where is the start of the breath? Because whenever I sit, take meditation or walking, I often have an image uh, like a circle of the breath from the center of the body and go around and then end of the, this uh, center. Um, but I feel somehow I control the breath. And when I study or I work, I like I'm not focused on that image or I forgot about the the circle and I easily to lose connection between my body and like and me I forgot about it and I forgot about the breath too like not focus on that so I don't know how to not control the breath and that's my question. Thank you. I have the, the feeling that, that if somebody were to tell you exactly where the breath begins, that would not help you not to control it. <laughs> you know, the breath is a... The more you look at it, the more it becomes a very strange object. It's very interesting. It becomes very, very interesting. You cannot pin down exactly where it starts. You cannot pin down exactly where it ends. And every breath is different from one another. So the main thing about um, not controlling is about getting interested into the breath. Yeah? If you're very mindful of your breathing and, and you always stick to it, you never leave it for a single instant, that is not said that that is good. It's not always good, you know. Uh, brothers told me a story of, uh, of a meditator who did a very intensive retreat. And for many hours on end, he was capable of not losing a single breath. You know, for maybe three hours, he would be sticking to the breath throughout the whole time, not losing a single moment. But the moment he stopped breathing mindfully like that, a lot of anger and, and resentment came up in him. You know, so that, that shows us that to, um, you know, to do exactly what the book says is not always the good thing. There's always that question of saying, am I listening to myself? And am I, am I interested in what's happening in there? Because when you close your eyes and you start meditating and you contact that world, the inner world of your experience, many very interesting things happen. You know, the way you perceive things, the things that arise in your mind. Everything has a message. Everything tells you something about yourself. 
you know. And if you get interested, then wanting to control, wanting to do good, to some extent, to meditate well, it, be, it goes, you know, as something that we can easily push aside. You know. But if we don't really touch that feeling of like, oh wow, I really want to understand more, I wanted to see more, I wanted to really understand what is happening in there. You know, and then we will ha we might have the the good students uh, syndrome. You know, try to do exactly what the teacher says, and then and follow very well. You know, <laughs> and Thai said many things. You know, and I realize that sometimes in my life, oh, I did exactly what Thai said, and it wasn't good for me, and I hurt myself. And of course, because you listen to Thai, but you don't listen to yourself. You know, your body has a say. Your mind has a say in the teaching. You know, we shouldn't get stuck just with what is recorded in the books or what a good teacher tells us. Because a good teacher has the responsibility to teach many people. Sometimes he's not directing his teaching just to me. So we always have to find the space to sort of wait the teaching and see what is good for us and what is making us grow in our practice and, and is really helping us. And that is the spirit of the Buddha. The Buddha taught his, uh, uh, his disciple not to listen to him. He said, don't, don't just listen to what I'm telling you. It might, not be, it might not be right. You try and if it works, you do it. You know? So that is, that is the spirit. And so I think, I think finding a good interest and finding a, a, a taste, you know, a joy, that, that is the joy of meditation, that, that, that interest, that it is kind of a sparkling, uh, um, you know, a, a light of, of wanting to know more about yourself, you know, that is, that is the lead to sort of begin to let go and, and not try to do well in meditating, you know. If you do well, it's not said that that is very well, <laughs> you know. You know. Thank you. Um, so, dear friends, our time is up. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this morning's uh, question and answer session. Thank you very much for your questions, and also thank you, everyone on the panel, for your answers and for your. Uh, offering uh, your experiences and your insights. Uh, we can uh, end with three sounds of the bell uh, just to come back to the breathing. The breathing is only a landing point to help us to come back to the present moment. Uh, it's uh, the presence that we need. And when we're back to the present moment, there for our body, our mind, then we begin to have a lot of insights about what's going on in our body and our mind and the world around us. Um, so the breathing alone is not enough, uh, but we need insight, we need understanding. And to have that understanding, we need to land in the present moment. Yeah? So I hope that's clear for everyone. We're not preaching mindful breathing only in Plum Village. Um, for those, uh, before we end with three sounds of bell, I'd like to add further that um, for those who sent up written questions, we also have a Dharma talk tomorrow and we'll send your written questions on to Brother Fab Jung, who will offer the, the last talk tomorrow. And also for those who still have other questions in your heart, you can um, maybe bring them to your Dharma sharing circle and uh, together we can look at those questions and share for, from our own experiences how we've um, addressed those questions in our lives. Uh, for now, we will end with three sounds of the bell. Please enjoy your breathing, your body, and each other's presence.